Show of hands. How many of you are swimmers? Okay. No, I mean like you really can swim. Raise hands. Okay, that's definitely not my reality. But let me paint the scene. On one side, you had all of the swimmers. They had their wristbands. They were jumping and diving inside of the water. Basketball court was over here, having a great time. This particular day, as I went swimming with my cousin, I'm here in the shallow end with the non-swimmers. They tried to give me this uh, floaty device, but I felt like I was a little too cool for that. So, you know, I said, I, I got this. As time went on, I found myself starting to get a little more confident, a little more comfortable. I'm like swim walking, you know? <laughs> and then something happened where somehow I lost track of where I was. The water started to become really, really, really tall. And I started to panic. And the more that I panicked, I started to sink. And I find myself screaming for help. But they jumping in the water, diving, playing basketball over here, over here. They're with the little floaty devices. And it seems as if no one can see me or hear me. And there's no lifeguard on duty. Screaming for help. My cousin. He ends up seeing me, and he makes a very, a big sacrifice. And he jumps in the water, and he saves my life. He's hot. I mean, he was like fully dressed. Fresh <laughs> shoes, pager on his, uh, his waist, watch on his wrist. But I think he made the right decision and jump in jumping <laughs> in to save my life. In our communities, there are young people who found themselves in situations where all hell has started to break loose. What used to be safe isn't safe anymore. And sometimes the water of life can seem so much that they find themselves in a situation where they're drowning. And they're silently screaming, but it seems as if no one can hear them, see them, or sometimes even care. Repeat after me. Say, where, where are, the are the lifeguards? Fast forward, elementary school, I was a terror. You know, mom just got laid off, so we had to uh, wear Payless for a little bit. I have a list, and a little socially introverted. So to get in trouble was my way to fit in. Got kicked out of one school, gave another teacher a nervous breakdown. And then fourth grade, Ms. Kono's class. She gave us this writing assignment to create a story and share it with the class. I typically did my work, so I did it. And that's when she realized that I had a gift for writing. From then on, instead of kicking me out of the class, instead of sending me home, she would force me, literally force me to sit inside of the corner and write stories. And at the end, I would have to share it to the class. By the end of the school year, I found myself begging her to write more and to share my stories with the rest of the class. She ended up opening the doors that others would soon water, that ingrained a statement that's more than a cliche to me, but is my reality, that the arts saved my life. Yeah. Here I am. Typical young man, single parent home, amazing mother, um, welfare system, never met my dad. I have this gift and I have this talent inside of me. But I find myself afraid, find myself insecure, and I find myself going through certain moments of drowning. And I needed something. Fast forward, 2007. 21-year-old teacher, and out of all of the amazing students that I, I met along the journey, one particular student comes to mind, Kimberly. I was introduced to her as a student who will wear all black. She wasn't eating and had cuts on her arms. I really got to know her when hiding her in the auditorium from her abusive boyfriend because she refused to put out. Taking her home one day, 
I met her mom because she pointed outside to her on the streets. From there, I learned her story of being a drug baby to group home, to being adopted by her grandmother, to her abusive boyfriend, to being raped all before high school. But she had a gift. She had a talent. She took to the stage like fish to water. And she didn't perform to entertain, but it was survival for her. So here we are, 2017. And I ponder these questions in my mind as I think of all the businesses and corporations looking at the millennials. We're studying how they, what they eat. We study how they dress. We study what it is that they like. And we're building our brands on these young people. But we're not taking the time to notice that this fatherless generation is hurting. In a time when our educational system is under attack, when budgets are being minced, when administrators, teachers, and programs are being eliminated to mitigate financial shortfalls, thriving educational programs and after-school programs barely exist these days. And the ones that do typically cater to elementary and sometimes middle school. But a lot of our high school and wandering young adults find themselves with no mentors, no lifeguards. After graduating from Morehouse College, I made a commitment when I came back home that I would answer that call and be able to be sensitive enough to care. But just like my teacher did, just like my cousin when he jumped in the water, to reach out and help. With literally no money in my pocket, I started a nonprofit, CBG Arts. Our goal was to use the arts to change young people's lives. We stand on our commitment to use the arts to give them enriching and engaging experiences in the arts. We believe that the arts serve as a mirror to society, but also should serve as its conscience. And we wanted to foster a community and a world where they could grow to be the giants that they have been called to be. Currently serving over 200 young people We've been able to see them grow, but then also not only graduate from high school, college, and go on to do stuff in TV, Broadway, and in educational world, but to also give back. One of the most humbling and most rewarding parts of the job is that 90% of our staff are former students who've now grown to be exceptional leaders and are giving back in our program. And of course, we're not the only ones doing it in our community. There are many nonprofits such as Brotherhood Crusade, Young Black Scholars, Pullum Center, all types of people who are giving back. But what if more? What if more leaders? What if more politicians? What if more church leaders made the decision to be sensitive enough to care and wanted to reach back and give, but finally be patient enough for the harvest? And oh boy, is it a harvest. I ended up adopting Kimberly as the daughter that I never had. She graduated from college. She's currently on a full ride scholarship in graduate school. She's teaching undergrad drama, writing and directing her own plays, and traveling, speaking to foster youth telling them a very familiar and story, old story that I once shared with her, that I was drowning, but someone saw me, and the art saved my life. She's now able to tell, the, tell them those things. She's able to be able to spit those quotes, like failure is not sin, low aim is. She's able to tell those things like in whatsoever thing you do, strive to do it so well that no man living, no man dead, no man yet to be born can do it better. And she and many other young people in our program will be able to reach far more people than I ever will. But isn't that, isn't that how it's supposed to be? My ceiling should be their floor. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, seething and the young, I am begging you, I am pleading to you today, 
to be the lifeguards in the other young people's lives. Repeat after me. If not me, if not me then, who? then who? If not now, if not now then, when? then when? I take the pledge, take the pledge. To, be the to be the lifeguard on duty. On duty. Thank you.